welcome to okay. it's a good segue to let you know that this meeting is being recorded um to our grapevine women in tech for gender equality quarterly meeting it's the first quarterly meeting of the year and let's get started uh this evening we're going to maintain a an agenda that's similar to what we have in the past uh, we're going to spend a little, we're going to do a fun icebreaker. We've already been cheating a little bit, those of us who jumped, hopped on the call early. Um, we're going to also hear from two nonprofits this evening. And so we will take what knowledge we learn about these nonprofits and make a decision about which one uh, should be awarded this quarter. But the good news is, and I want everybody to know, and I like to let everybody know that if you don't win this quarter, you just come back. Um, and then finally, we're going to hear, last but not least, we're going to hear a presentation, whoops, uh, by Mandy Kaczynski. Did I say your last name? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, again, my name is Holly Clark. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. And I threw up on this screen the leaders of our team, our Grapevine Giving Circle team. Um, but I'll go ahead and briefly introduce myself. And then I think we'll probably start our icebreaker. And with each person that moves from word to word, if you can introduce yourself and, and then say your word. Does that sound like a good plan, Tina? Yeah, just very fast introduction, though. We're not, not looking for anything too long. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I currently own four businesses and nonprofit, and I am about to launch another nonprofit. Um, so I'm running crazy constantly, but I've always had an affinity for staying up to speed on what's happening in the tech world and trying to learn and, and stay abreast of uh, things that are happening. And it's, it's, it is hard to keep up, but um, that's me in a nutshell. The word that we decided to go with that Tina has let us know we're going to play a game I'll, called. Let me kick. Yeah, let me let me describe the game because the first word will just kick it all off. Okay, Is that okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm I'm Tina Baugh. I'm a longtime healthcare IT leader. Um, I currently am leading an IT organization that uh, safeguards the blood and plasma supply for the United States. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, opportunity. And I'm really enjoying myself as we transform uh, the technology there and move 100% into the cloud from on-prem. So fantastic uh, and fun and a little bit nerve nerve wracking, um, but all, all fun. My passion is mentoring. Uh, so I'm, I mentor quite a bit and provide mentorship. Um, so uh, if you haven't checked out my YouTube channel, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I provide quite a bit and I'm always looking for new ideas uh, for the channel. Um, our icebreaker today uh, is exactly as Holly said, uh, starting with a word and I'm just going to say a word and um, it's going to be technology related. All the words should be technology related. And then you just want to, the next person is going to say the first word that comes to their mind related to that word, all technology related. We're not going to dive into a bunch of personal stuff, uh, all technology related, and then do your quick introduction. So we're going to call on the leaders kind of first, so you kind of get the rhythm of it. Um, and we'll go around. So the first word technology related uh, for me is the internet. Um so um, I was thinking about this word because my very first major multi-million dollar project was connecting the state of Texas K through 12 school districts, very first school district in the United States to the internet. That's how long I've been around. Uh, so um, I'm going to kick it off over to Kuki. Hey, everyone. My name is Kuki and I lead uh, product and business strategy at, at a genomics software as a service company. We're a, a small business based out of San Diego. Um, I love everything uh, women empowerment related and community related. So I've been a part of a lot of um, nonprofit organizations that continue to do so. Um, and related to the word Tina gave me, I would say, um, you said internet, right? Yes, cloud. So cloud comes to mind. Um, and I'll popcorn it to Megan. 
Hi, everyone. So relative to just a little scraping the surface of me, I'm taking a page from Holly's book. I'm a serial founder myself. Um, recently, over the past few years, have broken into the private equity space. And just uh, about two weeks ago, I accepted a new role um, as CEO of Manhattan Global Partners. So I'm going to be a senior partner over there. We invest in a lot of tech-based opportunities and um, bank roll-ups, uh, RIAs, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. But tech has always kind of been my home. I always find such passion and interest in really what is expanding and innovating in the tech world. So back to the word, when I think of uh, cloud, I think of AWS. Truly, because Amazon Web Services is the hub. And even though everyone tries to branch off, they're not quite as great as AWS. So let's see, I would popcorn. Let's see here. Well, we we have Tina. Let's popcorn Holly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Google. <laughs> okay. I've already introduced myself. Yeah, but you have to popcorn your next person. Oh, the next person. Janine. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Janine Niblock. I am the owner of SFDC Experts. It's a small Salesforce consulting company here in Austin, Texas. Um, and my main, you know, reason for starting my company uh, about two and a half years ago yeah, was to provide uh, pay equity for women in tech. Um, so this is like, I mean, I'm running a company for that. I have seven women on my team. Um, they're all, most, the majority are moms who have kids, cannot work a 40 mm -hmm. or don't want to, can't work a 40 hour work week. They need the flexibility to pick up, drop off, et cetera. So, um, I will say my tech word is, um, hmm, workflow. <laughs> And oh, I need a popcorn. I'm gonna popcorn to um Heather. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I too am a serial entrepreneur, as it happens. I'm here tonight representing Black Girls Code, uh, an organization I've been a founding member of. Um my uh cloud-based uh, term is technically two words, multi-tenancy. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, and that's because if you want to scale, you have to accomplish this to really get the scale out of your AWS platform. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you more about Black Girls Code later tonight. Heather, would oh, you like oh, to ask? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Pick someone. Oh, yeah, right. And the one other thing I should say is right now I'm acting as the CFO of another um, another startup called uh, Resilient Healthcare, which is a health tech company. We are taking hospital hospital care to homes, and we're doing it through a SaaS platform that provides end-to-end -end services for hospitals, meaning they deploy the clinicians, they do everything to... Um, on the other end, the billing services. So um, popcorn, I will select Jerrica. Well, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Jerrica Simone. I'm the executive director of Intech Foundation. You all have already heard a little bit about me uh, before those of you all who um, didn't get to hear it. Um, I'm a creative, I'm a musician, I'm a leader. Um, I'm a community organizer. I have my roots in grassroots um, organizing. Um, but I have a huge passion for tech. Um, and so this stemmed from some of my creative endeavors in, in art and in music, and it's just grown into what I what I do today. Um, I think, um, you know, with um, multiple tendency, I would add, um, honestly, it's like my big thing and it's, kind of related in the sense that when I think of um, multi-tenancy, again, we are thinking about scaling. And I think that with scaling an organization, you're scaling culture and people um, and awareness too. And so I think my word association, although loose, um, would be advocacy um, and expansion. 
did you say advocacy? And expansion, yes. And expansion. Okay, thank you. She couldn't just pick one. She's gotten two. No. <laughs> Maybe it's the rock and roll in me. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Jerrica, you're awesome. Um, pick, go ahead and pick your next person. Sure. Um, Gloria, you want to step in? Definitely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gloria Harris, and I'm the head of learning and talent engagement for uh, PDI Technologies, which is a software company that powers C stores um, globally. Uh, I definitely have a passion for tech, uh, especially in the role that I'm in where it's all about development. And I feel that it was just really on time that Jerica chose me because um, advocacy is so important to me and in the role that I am in, it's all about making sure that everyone has an opportunity to be their best selves, um, to try things, to innovate, and just to be excited every day that, when they come to work. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was like, wow, that's really on time. Um, I think for me, um, in addition to that, there's so many things happening in the world right now. And what comes to mind for me is aligning advocacy and another A word, which is AI. It, I can't get it out of my head. It's all in there. Um, I'm even taking a course because I need to get more comfortable with it. Um, and with that, I will popcorn over to Emma. Thanks, Gloria. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, you here, Emma. Uh, I own operations uh, and enablement uh, when it for talent at an observability. I guess we're a scale up now rather than a startup uh, called Chronosphere. So we're in the observability space. So all of y'all talking about cloud, multi-tenancy, um, feels right at home. Um, when I think about AI, I oh I love the two words because I'm always that I'm that person as well. I, I like I get told one and I always I always say more than one. I would say I think cautious optimism. Um, and I feel like that is a word that is often tied. To technology uh, because we want to be optimistic, but it can get real scary real fast. Uh, who has not gone yet? Uh, Melissa, oh, popcorn to you. Hello. Um, I am the director of product management for a company called Gym Pass. So we focus on fitness technology and employee well being. So we offer basically fitness and kind of like whole health programs, mental health, uh, physical health, nutritional health, um, smoking cessation, basically anything you can think of that's like whole person well-being as part of company kind of benefits packages. We go in and help companies try to make their employees the best they can be. Um, I was kind of hoping I would get to come after the, the whole advocate, advocacy and expansion part because we are really, really starting to focus on equitable whole health because of the fact that obviously health at this point is not very equitable. And we are very much recognizing that and trying to fix that on the technology side as well because accessibility is, as we all know, I think here, not the greatest at this point. Uh, thinking about some of the last words like cloud, AI, cautious optimism, um, I'm going to say machine learning because we are working on some search recommendation algorithms right now and we are very optimistic that our machine learning, machine learning algorithms are going to do what we want them to do. So. I think Julia. Yeah, who else? So, sorry, that maybe. Julia has not gone, and who else? I'll pop one to Julia. We have Mandy too, I think. Okay, couple, couple. We got a couple more. Okay. Hi, Julia. Hello. This is my first event. Uh, excited to be here with you all, and. Oh. Um, because it's International Women's Month, happy International Women's Month and almost Women's Day. 
We're running multiple events, so I'm I'm not going to stay long, but I'm loving this so far. I run Million Dollar Women here in New York City, and um, we're helping women to scale up their businesses and also to learn how to sell. Our goal is to help 1 million women get to 1 million in revenues. And I'm particularly interested in being part of this group because I'm leaning heavily into digital avatars. I made a, a digital twin. My first career was as a filmmaker, so I've always been drawn to everything multimedia. And I've been using my digital twin in my business and my teaching, and I just think there's such a huge opportunity for women there. So my two words are gonna be digital avatar. And I'm off to South by Southwest if anyone else is going. <laughs> Heather, maybe I'll see you there. I hope so. Popcorn. Okay. So um, Devon, that was Devon's note taker. Let's see who didn't go. Uh, help me out here. Madison with a Y? No, that's also Otter. I think Sarithram and Mandy. Megan. Wagner. Mandy, over to you. All right. Awesome. This is my first meeting as well. So I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am your operations girl. So I have worked across digital media for my entire career, um, 13 plus years at this point. I have led a series of different tech teams globally, um, regionally, um, primarily focused on programmatic, but I ended up getting brought into pretty much everything. Um, so tech has really become my home and something that I think is, you know, an area where there's a lot of growth for women specifically. And I'm excited to see more women do it. All my teams, when I come into them are all men and I quickly change that. Um, and it's just, it's just funny that way. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. So I will say a word that I will ping pong off of that. Um, is I'm going to say virtual economy. I think that's that's a, in the same ball game. All right. And so who do we have left? Let me see. Serena? Or, no, I think I pronounced that wrong. I apologize. Who, who, who do we Sarita? have left? Yeah, Serena. So, Serena, over to you. Awesome. Uh... I'll put my video on for a little bit um, just because I do have a running toddler um, all over. But uh, Sarita, I have um, over 12 years of experience in health tech and in AI and in data. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, spoiler alert, my word was going to be data sets because I work um, with like creating really good data sets for the healthcare space. Um, most recently, my role has actually been um, through the Robin Hood Foundation based here in New York City, I helped found a nonprofit that works to create um, uh, like a, a better disability claims by analyzing medical data in order to ensure that the individual has like the best case of um, um, applying for disability through the federal government. Um, I'm actually currently just a board member there now because I've, I've um, stepped away because I'm expecting my second child. So I'm, um, but I am also in the job market. I'm looking for a more full-time stable um, position. So if anybody has anything that they're looking for product resources, I'm your girl. Um, and I'm also not sure who hasn't gone yet. So- Megan I'll Wagner. Uh, popcorn to Megan. Hello, I am Megan Wagoner. Um, I thought I turned my video on, but I don't know if you can see it. Um, can see it. Oh, I'm sorry then. Um, no, I'm cooking dinner, so I stepped away for a second, but uh, this is my first time joining um, and actually participating. I think I've joined one just quietly before. Uh, I work for Endeavor, um, which is a multi-country, um, national, you know, big corporation holding company. And specifically, I work for Endeavor Streaming, which is the technology arm. And we do direct to consumer uh, streaming platforms for companies like the UFC and um, WNBA and things like that. So um, I lead all of the media and entertainment commercial team. And I've been doing media for about 20 years. But only the past, I would say, half decade have I been in the digital side. But I love it because I can see the transformation of old school, like hardware moving into the cloud and people that um, were saying they would never do it are now 
all about it. So it's fun to see that kind of transition. Um, I'm also on another nonprofit, a board called Women in Streaming Media, where I'm vice president. And I also love mentorship. I got to start a mentorship program and we won the um, Social Impact Special Award for International Broadcasters Convention this past year. So very excited about that to say that we're award winning now. And um, yeah, I'm going to check out your YouTube page. So very cool. Um, let's see. So what did you say? Data something was the last one. Um, data sets. Okay. So I'm going to say geofencing or piracy because uh, data sets are super important to be able to identify who is accessing what. And with the type of content that we stream, we have to be very sensitive to not get it to places that it shouldn't be and also stop people when they're pirating it. Nice to be here. Oh, anybody else? I think we just have a bunch of AI note takers. <laughs> you have any more people? In the back. <laughs> Which is pretty awesome. It's awesome to see. Wow. Tina, did you see how we literally went from internet to kind of advocacy back to AI? I feel like this is just such a diverse opportunity to connect with all of you really see where your passions lie, where you, how your brains work. We are a bunch of really smart women. So I'm so happy to be in this room with all of you. Absolutely. And that's the whole point of the, the fun exercise is to kind of get to know each other a little bit and a little bit about each other, introduce ourselves and, and have a little fun with it. And um, I hope we all do connect and continue those conversations. I see a few people dropping in some information in the chat and do drop in your LinkedIn connections. Uh, I think ours were dropped in at the very beginning and please do connect and, and keep those conversations going because uh, we are all a lot of very sm smart women uh, who do a lot of great work. So, all right, Holly, back to you. Yeah, I would certainly echo that comment. I'm, I'm thrilled to be in the presence of such powerful women. All right. Speaking of events, we heard South by Southwest, I think was an upcoming event. Any other things to note, announcements to make? for the good of the order here and, and let people know about? Um, I know that the um, the Female Founders Forum, so if anyone is in Jacksonville, um, the Female Founders Forum is throwing an event on International Women's Day, which is coming up on Friday, I believe. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to make that event because my husband, it's his birthday. So I had to choose between Women's Day and my husband. I chose him this time. So I think um, that event looks phenomenal. I was invited to speak there. They will have the CEO and founder of Care.com speaking. Um, so that's super exciting too. Just another powerful woman who's built something amazing. Um, a lot of opportunity to connect with. It's with PS27 Ventures. Have them here on my t-shirt. It's an investment group that I'm a part of. Um, but if you're looking to the Jacksonville area, I recommend it. Thank you. Megan. Um, I have one more to add as well. So I'm organizing a conference called Executive Women of Guizueta. That's my business school based in Atlanta, Georgia. So if anybody's in Atlanta, Georgia, that's also happening on um, Women's Day, International Women's Day. I'll drop the link here uh, just so you guys can see the speakers and things like that. Awesome. Any other events to mention? All right. So we spent a little bit of time last quarter going over how actually giving circles work. Um, they've become kind of the, um, well, how, I don't know, the it thing to do in the Philippines philanthropic world right now, I feel. Um, but the way I like to think about it, and I it, this diagram illustrates it well, you know, it's each of us giving a small amount and then our collective being able then to make a huge impact. Um, at the On the right, you'll see that we, as our group, Women in Tech for Gender Equality on Grapevine's Great 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 platform, have been able since 2022 to raise uh, over $30,000. But I feel like, honestly, we could do better. 
So I'm, I'm suggesting everybody today, this evening, to be like Jess. So who is Jess? Jess, I don't know that much about Jess other than she gives a quarterly donation. Um, if each of us, we have 227 members, if each of us were to give $52, which is the average amount that our membership gives, if each of us were to give $52 each quarter, then we could in one year raise $47,216 in one year, just one year. So I, I felt like to give you the numbers would really kind of hit home maybe <laughs> um, the potential of what our impact could be. And I'm not gonna linger on it too much longer, but I will say this in closing with respect to encouraging you to uh, donate to our giving circle. We currently for this quarter have raised $4,449.15, but we set our goal higher this quarter and we have set our goal at $5,500. So we're shy $1,050.85. Not quite sure how the cents is. Some folks are leaving some like making some odd donation amounts maybe, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to think before the end of our donation cycle, we can hit that goal. So I I just ask you guys to think about um, donating if you can. All right. So that brings us to our pitch event for this evening. We have two, two nonprofits who are nominated this quarter. We have Intech Foundation, and Black Girls Code, and how this event will go. Each of our nonprofit nominees uh, will present, and then we will conduct a brief Q&A. So each nominee will have 10 minutes total. And then every member who's made a contribution will have the opportunity to vote, and that takes place on the Grapevine platform. And Megan's gonna drop the link in the chat at some point, she'll do that. Uh, so then all of the funds raised will be directed to that selected nonprofit. But as I mentioned earlier, come back to us. If you'd like to be considered next quarter, we're happy to have you present again and, and we'll just keep it giving. All right. So let's start. Jarika, are you ready to rock and roll? <laughs> I can. All right. I'm going to let you share your screen. I'm going to stop sharing mine. All righty. Give me one second. Thank you all for inviting me. I am always so thrilled to just connect with other folks who are like-minded, um, not only just to hang out, but to show all the awesome things that our community is doing. And so let me get us in presentation mode and hop right on in it. All righty. Do you all see this okay? I think it just nod or, okay, cool. <laughs> cool. So again, my name is Jerica Simone. I am the executive director of InTech Foundation. In Tech Foundation is a nonprofit whose mission is to inspire girls and gender expansive youths to create tech sol solutions for good. Our programs are designed to explore Black and Latinx perspectives um, and their contributions in technology, although we do welcome everyone. And we serve youth between 10 and 17 years old. So our main, let me move this out your way. Um, we anchor our programs and really honestly all of our operations um, in these three pillars. So first, we are an, an education nonprofit. We inform, we inspire, we like to ask kids to combine the passions for things that they already have, those everyday ways of knowing and meshing that with technology and the way that you can use tech to as a tool to understand the world. And by group um, facilitations, collaborations and projects, students are able to not only find new ways to help bring communities together, but also strengthen the bonds that they have 
between their Black and Latinx peers and ultimately become the, the next generation of technologists. And so generally speaking, um, our programming um, is currently offered for folks who identify as a girl or gender expansive that does include our trans um, identities. Um, so we do welcome boys um, who are um, identified as trans or non-binary. We um, serve, of course, students between middle school and high schools. Um, all of our scholars do need access to Wi-Fi or transportation, but we do provide laptops. All of our programming is in EST, um, simply because we're rooted in North Carolina, although our virtual communities um, extends much further, both in the US, Canada, and in South America. And our programs are currently um, offered in English, but we do have bilingual accommodations for folks who need Spanish or French. Um, and so this is just a quick map of our general scholar um, distribution. These are kind of our hot spots, if you will, of um, students um, in their communities. Um, you will see a broken out map um, that is North Carolina specific, just to illus illustrate not only where our route is, but where we have um, facilitated programs in the past. We were established in 2014 on the campus of UNCC um, Charlotte, but we have been going strong ever since. <clears throat> so this is our program demographics. Um, just to give you a snapshot of what we've done so far. So um, we have served 1,584 scholars, um, given 351 scholarships and 245 solutions have been made. Of our demographics, you can see that the majority of our student population is um, African-American, followed by our Latinx folks, um, and so on. You all can read, so <laughs> I won't go on too much longer. Um, these are our sources um, of funding and in kind donations. These are just kind of a snapshot of all the folks who have donated to Intech over the course of our establishment. Um, so I wanna share a quick story because something magical happened last year during summer camp. So during summer camp, we did something different. We asked our students to take complete control and tell us exactly what they wanted to learn during summer camp. What we were surprised about is that our students really wanted to start tech businesses. They really wanted to take um, technology into their own hand and create their own paths um, to create um, solutions for their community. They told us that the thing that was concerning them or really on their mind was homelessness. And so throughout the course of that one week, um, they made a project. And I wanted to show you just a little bit of what they've made to anchor my ask. Um, <laughs> so these are two highlighted projects. Um, I wanna show these just because this is a snapshot of what we are planning for summer camp this year and I'm asking you all for summer camp money. So let's just keep this in the back of our mind as we move forward. Um, so, oh, oh no. Can we pause our time really quickly? Um, Cause my screen is doing something right now. Well, all looks good from our end, just so you know. <laughs> uh, oh. Okay, so what I see is a map of Chicago. We don't see that. We don't see that, yeah. Yeah, we still see your what is job uh, finder. And... Yeah, job finder and homeless helpers. Oh, okay. So, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to do this from memory. <laughs> Um, so essentially what the kids did um, was they came together and they created um, two um, concepts for businesses. They created full-blown business plans and they um, created logos. And so Job Finder um, is specifically for folks who are um, brand new to um, the U.S. or folks who are looking um, to um, find a job and they're houseless. 
Um, and the idea is that this platform will not require that much um, identification and, and it would be a really easy way for folks to be able to interconnect with jobs and matching um, houseless folks with employers who are ready to meet their needs. The second one would be um, the kids just created a, like a robot um, that was interested or developed to help serve um, the community and give them medicine. What we found um, was based on their um, feedback, the kids loved it. They want to do it again. And so this summer, we're going to do an expanded version of this, a larger version, um, where we are inviting 40 students to come spend one week with us um, to develop their own business, um, to develop their own business blog and their own plan. Um, here, I have something pictured. It's our um, camp schedule, hopefully, if I remember the order of the slides. Yes. Um, okay, cool. And this is just to give you a, a snapshot of what the kids get when they come to summer camp at Intech. You'll see um, opportunities for outside engagement. We do hiking, we do offline, online coding. We do all kinds of things to help boast, um, boost and boast um, our kids' um, talents um, and pre-existing passions. Um, so this is a brief slide just kind of encapsulating exactly what um, we're doing this summer. And so kids are going to be learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, as well as how to launch their business. Um, I'm not sure which slide we're on, but maybe you might see some snapshots of kids yeah. working. Okay, cool. Yes, come you on. know your stuff. Yes. <laughs> so um, our ask, um, so we really, um, based on our feedback, we really want to support our students making sure that they have um, forever learning digital devices and full um, scholarship tuitions to our camp. We found that a lot of our students um, actually have benefited from this, um, not only just from just a personal standpoint, but we have also seen that our families have really also been able to utilize the um, addition of digital devices in their home. Students also get access to over 320 hours worth of independent learning material uh, once they um, enroll. And so our ask is that you help us fundraise money for 40 students to go to Intech um, camp for free. In total, that's a $4,000 ask. Um, any remaining funds would be used for program facilitation expenses or operation costs. I hope that the next slide should be a very, very high level breakdown <laughs> of what our expenses actually are. Um, you, you can see our total expense so far. Um, you see our camp fees. Um, this is for presuming that everyone pays. We want to create a, a scenario that no one pays. And so our ask for you again is to cover the $4,000 for the 40 students um, to be able to get um, free lunch, laptops, over 300 um, hours worth of self-directed learning, merchandise, and amazing instruction during camp. Oh, so that yeah, questions for Jerika. <laughs> I know this is a very random question and I ask everyone to forgive me, but I noticed that in the schedule you say light breakfast. Mm -hmm. Is there like are and I just imagining like our ch our children, right? They're hungry, they're going to need fuel all day like is there a reason the light versus just like a full like? Yeah, um, to be honest, it really what has been based on what we've gotten donated in the past. And so okay. before we've just gotten fruits and, and granola okay. and that kind of stuff, I would 100% and not only me, but the children will 100% love a full blown breakfast. Okay. Um, so Okay, I was just curious, right? Because I wasn't sure, like, are we expecting that they arrive and they've been fed or, you know, is it a, it's a day camp, right? So they're getting dropped off and, okay. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, sometimes um, whether or not a child eats before our program really does depend on, um, you know, other things that are a little more home-based. And so in right. 
to accommodate everyone, but also kind of keep a little air of community and sameness. We keep it very cute, um, so to speak. And we allow the students to go grab um, food if they want it, when they want it. Okay, amazing. Our lunch is actually done in the dining hall um, at UNCC. Or uh, UN, yeah, yeah, UNCC. Um, and I will say that our students really, really enjoy that. Not only just getting used to kind of the college feel, but yeah. also it's like, buffet and just all that. Amazing. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. <laughs> all right. Cookie, was that timer set for seven minutes or 10? 10. Okay. All right. Um, if you guys have any other questions for Drake, if you drop them in the chat, we'll just keep keep moving on here. And I ask Heather, are you able to share your screen with us? I am. Yes. Okay. Delighted awesome. to. Awesome. Um, seems like, oh, no, there we go. Okay, great. All right, I'm trying to get to slide share. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, um, and I may be fuzzier on some of the details as I'm not the executive director or CEO of the organization, uh, but I am a founding board member of Black Girls Code and um, was until October of last year, the, the chair of the board of, of Black Girls Code, mm -hmm. and I'm still supporting the new CEO and team as we're expanding and growing very rapidly. Um, our, our new fearless leader is Christina Jones, who was the EVP of uh, technology and creative strategy for Salesforce and previously, um, I'm sorry, chief engagement officer at Salesforce and EVP of technology and creative strategy at 20th Century Fox. Um, clearly the, the um, opportunities uh, that we're facing for Black girls on, on behalf of Black girls and uh, gender nonconforming folks is that the reality of technology and AI are now. Um, I was working with Bill Gates back in 2017 and we were projecting all the future of this, the future of work, the future of technology. Well, it's here in the present now. <laughs> um, and so we've got to catch everybody, else, uh, everybody up. Um, additionally, uh, there are some sobering uh, statistics that I'd I'd like to bring to your attention. One is that 1.8% of science and engineering occupations are held by Black women currently. And um, as an entrepreneur, I'll also say that only 0.4 of a percent of all venture-backed founders are Black women. Um, only 1% total of venture back founders are black. So we've got a real um, chasm of, um, uh, in terms of an uh, equity gap and an opportunity gap that we are trying to close. At Black Girls Code, we have three buckets of programming that we talk about. Some that is designed to expose and, exp and inspire people about all the possibilities. Another bucket, which is around educating. So we go from lightweight to very deep into different programming um, and technology uh, content, types of content around technology. And then we've, um, with Christina's leadership, really have focused on a, a third component, which we call launch. And um, I'll jump to this and go back. I'm sorry for the out of order here, but it's um, sort of easier to see. In the Inspire bucket, we're working with typically younger um, or at least less experienced people who have less experience with technology. And they're learning about the kinds of opportunities um, that range from you know gaming to UX and the different kinds of careers and, and things people can make with technology. 
We have a whole host of different um, courses ranging from code clubs, which are after school programs in elementary and middle schools, to summer camp programs, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, to um, something we call Code Along, which is a series of um, modules taught by Black girls to the to um, whoever wants to consume the courses on YouTube. And um, we actually had um, in our Code Along um, content that we launched last year, we had over um, 5 million people consuming that content. And we just recently completed a, um, Jerica, you, Jerica, you would have loved this competition called Build a Beat Challenge for our, our children. Um, and they got to mix um, music and the winner of the challenge got a, a Zoom um, meeting with Ciara. And we actually had a billion impressions from that challenge. And um, all of the, the finalists, I listened to 10 different, I guess, um, uh, songs that were compiled were all amazing. <laughs> they were so good in all different types of genres. So it was really fun. And um, the young woman who won, I, I wish I had a picture of her with me here, but she um, she's um, a seventh grader. She competed in another similar competition last time and didn't win. We asked her, did you think you were going to win this, this challenge? She said, "I actually, I did, because she plays like every instrument and said, um, you know, she had worked on her coding capabilities and really upskilled and uh, she, she slayed on this one. Um, anyhow, we have all kinds of technical programs, some that are really oriented towards jobs, um, meaning paid fellowships and, and permanent full-time employment. And then we have this, this, other, um, this other component we call launch, which is, like I mentioned, really focused on upskilling, getting people into jobs upskilling so that they're on a leadership track in their organizations and increasingly getting people on entrepreneurial um, pathways. Um, I, we know that um, uh, roughly about 5% of any population uh, where it's, it runs through our, our, our blood to be entrepreneurs. And we want to, um, to let those young people um, as early as middle school or wherever they, they start that journey, uh, let them know that there are opportunities to be entrepreneurs if that's the right thing for them. Uh, we also focus on mental and physical wellness. Um, we have a whole financial literacy program that starts with young people and goes through adulthood and wealth building. Um, so we're, we're committed to uh, building programming for um, a lifetime of, of of experiences with Black Girls Code. Um, we are focused on 16 cities um, or geographies, and, um, and that roughly translates in the K-12 environment to um, a total addressable market of 1.6 million girls and gender non-conforming folks. Um, and then we also have a lot of collegiate and uh, workforce development programs that work with um, older youth. Um, our, our idea is around our content is, as I said uh, earlier, to try to expose people to um, the world of possibilities and then to allow people to go as deep in the levels of um, areas that they're interested in. And so we are, will be talking and focusing on Gen, Gen AI, cybersecurity, animation and gaming, um, computing and programming, UX, UI, cloud, as we talked about earlier, robotics, et cetera. Um, and this is an example of one of our very exciting um, programs and partnerships uh, starting this year. Uh, we're, we're partnering with ServiceNow, which has um, 2,000 jobs that we are training, uh, recruiting and training people for. Some are really focused on um, ServiceNow admin jobs, which are for folks who maybe um, don't have CS backgrounds, but um, are really good at workflow and good at um, the kinds of skills that functional skills that are required for ServiceNow admin positions. Other folks are coming out of and being recruited from CS programs are getting deep into JavaScript. 
But um, all of our programs, what we try to do is not reinvent what's already being offered um, by ServiceNow and by other partners of ours, but to wrap around it and build community so that somebody from our program um, can get and have experiences with a cohort of similar like-minded people where they're getting exposed to hard skills, leadership skills, um, and things like uh, technical interview prep. They get one-to-one -one coaches. They also get free seat licenses um, on the Udemy platform, which has the largest library of technical skills training. Um, they get support to take assessments, get certifications, and we match them oftentimes with uh, paid fellowships where uh, we hope that those are, um, and we found that they're more likely to convert to actual full-time employment. So we're working with people as young as seven and up through um, 25 plus in age now. So we've kind of expanded in that way. And these are some of the logos that we're working with. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we have a number of different kinds of programs. We have some programs that are fully in person, some that are online, um, but synchronous with a cohort of folks, and then some that are at your, at your own pace and uh, supplemental or standalone, which are the YouTube programs like Code Long or supplemental like the Udemy programs. And we've got um, a whole uh, full calendar of different programming happening in different cities. So that's an overview of what we're doing. Um, for the summer camps, we have four summer camps coming out this year. One that's really fun is a partnership with Spellman um, in Atlanta, which they have a brand new gaming lab. And so what we'll be doing is working with their gaming lab for a week on um, their campus and then placing um, young folks into paid fellowships in different gaming um, environments, ranging from Epic to uh, small women-led um, gaming studios in Southern California and sort of everything in between. We're working on climate in New York uh, with NYU and with, I think, Mills, hopefully, in the Bay Area. And then we're working with ASU on some media tech programming in, um, in DC um, so I, and LA. So I hope that gives you an overview of what we're up to. And it was really nice to meet you all. Thank you, Heather. All right, let's drop questions, if you would, for Heather in the chat. Um, first off, can we go back to that first two pages where it showed the statistic? Can you just pull that up real quick? Because as soon as you said that and I saw that, Honestly, I felt chills, got tears to my eyes. I think that that is a statistic that needs to change um, right at the beginning there. I, I just feel like no one in my, I mean, I in my business, in all of them, um, they're minority owned with my partnerships. On top of my partnerships, most of them are black. And unfortunately, I'm one of the only women in them. But I feel like this this specific statistic just speaks volumes of really accessibility and really allowing women in all communities to get access to uh, education on really building on their passions and the capabilities and encouragement that they receive from being in groups like yours and like Cherica's are tremendous because back when I was a young woman and all of my friends were young women, I we didn't get much encouragement in any type of group to pursue entrepreneurship. And I think that what you're building out is phenomenal, both of you. Um, you know, I don't have any children, but one day when I do, I would hope that they would want to be a part of an organization just like yours, because it, learning and being surrounded by like-minded individuals and pursuing, you know, helping them to pursue their passions and realizing you can start a business out of anything that your heart really desires, anything you feel passionate in. So um, it wasn't as much of a question, but a compliment. And, you know, I really, really hope that not just through women in tech, but on top of that, a few of my organizations like Doomsday Partners, Manhattan Global Partners, I'd be really interested to see how we can intertwine because we have a foundation over there too. So I'd love to see how I can connect you all and support you even further than what we're doing here today. 
No, that's wonderful to hear. And um, I'd, I'd love for uh, Jerrica to join in too, but I will say a couple of things. One is that um, I had the really dubious distinction from 2012 through 2018 of being the black woman who had raised the most venture capital. And, um, and, oh, back, then, and, and back then there were, there was a photo shoot with Vanity Fair where there, I think there were 23 of us black women who had, we were the only women throughout the country who had raised more than a million dollars. And it was really a sad and lonely space. Things are not that much better today. Um, it's why uh, Black Girls Code, we're working on a series specifically for founders where we highlight Black women founders of tech companies. And we'll be launching next year, actually a venture capital fund just to invest in Black women and, and gender non-conforming um, people because um, it it is there is such an inefficiency of of capital backing these folks, but we also know we have to start on the pipeline early on, and we have to continue to build it and feed it and nurture it and cultivate it so that by the time people are looking at college, they're um, getting the right tech experiences in companies sometimes, whether they're startups or big companies, and then they're able to launch their own ventures that every step of the way that they're being backed and supported. So it takes a whole village. Um, obviously, the backlash of um, uh, against DE&I and things that like I never thought diversity nor equity nor inclusion were harmful, hateful words, but you would think it nowadays. And um, and we've just uh, we've realized that in some ways it's left an opening, um, but also a mandate where we're finding companies of all sizes are saying we've got to do things now. We've got to step up. You know, we've got to hold this space for Black Girls Code, for organizations like this to make sure that we're not falling back behind where we were before. So thank you for everything that you do. It takes all of us. And we are having I didn't announce it at the the date thing now, but actually tomorrow evening in LA, if any of you are in LA, we're having a salon about Black Girls Code um, and could share the in invite for that. We have one in New York coming up on April 3rd, um, hosted at the Service Now offices. Excuse me, we'll have one in uh, San Francisco after Labor Day and one in Miami uh, the first week of December, right on the heels of Art Basel. Oh, that's awesome. Please share all of those. I know our team either they'll travel to those potential locations or hubs or they live there. I have an office in New York and I'll be up there over the next couple of months. So I'd be really interested to see if I could make it. That would be so fun. Oh, that'd be great. We also have programming. So like on Saturday of this week in LA, we're at the Beehive. We have 200 girls. It's been um, over... Um, uh, oversubscribed. We have 200 girls who are learning to code and create games and we'll be doing, you know, you saw the calendar, there's a whole bunch of programming, but we're always looking for volunteers. So I'll um, make sure we keep you all up to date. Who do I email if I want to send the calendar information or the invites? I would say Kuki would be the best person. Okay, to right, email. right, right. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this is awesome. Does anyone else have any additional questions for Heather? Heather, if you would mind um, stop sharing so oh, sure, sure. bring us back. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. All right, any other questions? All right, if you think of something, you have a burning question, drop it in the chat, if you would. So, voting is open. To do that, you can go to the Grapevine app, and you have until March 14th, and then we'll announce the winner on March 15th. All right. And... Finally, this evening, we're going to hear from Mandy Kajinski, who is the Senior Director of Buyer Development at Media.net and an Executive MBA candidate at the Quantic School of Business and Technology. She is an accomplished sales and operations executive with a proven track record in driving significant revenue growth and operational efficiencies across technology and media sectors. 
an expert in conducting detailed business reviews to uncover new revenue streams, enhancing partner relations for market expansion, and leading cross-functional teams to improve project delivery and operational innovations. Proficient in deploying programmatic strategies, driving product innovation, and developing strategic partnerships. Recognized for establishing a pioneering programmatic strategy division and achieving rapid professional growth through strategic reorganization and innovation. Mandy's presentation explores the intricate relationship between diversity, inclusion, emotional intelligence, and their collective impact on redefining professional appearance and leadership within the workplace. It calls for a shift toward leadership that transcends gender norms, emphasizing confidence, competence, and the ability to authentically express oneself. The goal is to ignite a reflective conversation on how modern professionals can navigate this evolving landscape of workplace expectations advocating for a future where leadership is defined not by gender norms and appearance, but by action and inclusion. Mandy, if you would, I'm gonna stop, whoop, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can take it away. All right, sounds good. I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh my gosh, like you made me sound so fancy. Thank you so much for That's that. <laughs> Am I still, oh. I'm still sharing, aren't I? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. Let me know when you can see. I can uh, see. Good. Okay, cool. All right. So I know we're kind of running low on time, so I will make sure I'm super respectful of that. But, you know, this topic is super important to me. I think, you know, nobody can kind of see me right now. I think in the world of of, or how tall I am, I should say in the world of zoom. It's, it's funny. I am, I'm five, one, all almost maybe five, one. Um, I'm pretty short and I, I'm just like kind of a small human. So I think I kind of throw people off when I walk into a room and I realize that my whole life, um, I'm a woman, I'm a smaller woman, but I pack a punch and I don't think people expect it sometimes. So as I have navigated my career, I've realized that I have had some challenges with that, getting in the door, getting at the table. And then once I'm at that table, you know, having that opportunity to talk. So that's really where this comes from. I've always been extremely passionate about diversity, DE&I, inclusion, what that looks like, um, working in the tech space, all the different sectors that, that impact specifically for me, um, you know, looking at AI, looking at the publishing world, looking at minority owned and operated publishers and what that looks like and uh, fair access to education and information and um, you know all of that. So it, it's always been something that has been so important to me. So, you know, for me, I always say, and I love this quote, um, Myers is the author of Moving Diversity Forward and how to go from well-meaning to well-doing. If you guys haven't read it, it's, it's awesome. Um, but diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. So we can all be in a room, but if nobody's listening to us and wanting to include us in the conversation and understand our point of view and our perspective and our experiences, we, sh you know, it doesn't even matter if we're there. So that's, that's really where this stems from. And I, I will wrap all these, you know, points up together. So you know, I think when it comes down to it and, you know, when I think about our political landscape right now, when I think about the disparities that we see in the world right now, the one thing that we all have to remember and something that I really focus on is everybody wants to be heard and everybody wants to be understood. Everybody, you know, those around you, they want to, you know, essentially know that you are listening to them. So, you know, this is kind of like a lifetime example for me. Um, my personal Instagram account, I tend to post a lot of different content looking at different points of view. And all of a sudden, um, you know, on February 10th, Instagram had essentially made a announcement that they were no longer going to promote or boost any creator content that had to do with the political election. And that received a ton of backlog backlash. Um, I was actually not privy to it. I don't work in, you know, directly in Instagram. And as you guys know, being in the tech space, there's lots of different elements there. Um, but I had posted some stuff and I got put in Facebook jail for it. And I was like, what in the world? That's so crazy. Like, this was like not any, this was just like inclusive content. Like, what is going on? 
So I put my kids to bed. I come back downstairs. I'm like, I have to be out of Facebook jail or meta jail. I'm like, there's no way. I get back on and they had like promoted my account to a professional account, made me a digital creator and like have been boosting my content sense, which has been so interesting because the feedback that I've been getting has really come from all these different places and all these different audiences outside of my typical bubble, really asking for more information. Um, and it's really been one of, one of the most significant lifetime examples of really, as I post things, people kind of respond back and they're like, no, I hear you. And I, you know, um, I want to be heard too. So it really played into this nicely. Um, but it's hard because then there's some people, you know, when their values and their viewpoints don't align with yours. So it is super easy to get defensive and want to defend your, uh, defend your perspective. But, you know, what I've continuously had to tell myself, not only in this position, but also in my leadership positions when I'm managing teams, um, is that everybody has a viewpoint. And although I might not agree with that viewpoint, whether it's professionally, personally, politically, it is a viewpoint and it does have to be considered and it does have to be incorporated. Um, and I have, in my experience, felt that once somebody feels that their experience and their view and their opinion is being taken into consideration, you know, those defense mechanisms really do start to go down and communication is, you know, at that point, somewhat possible, even with people that you might not think you can ever, you know, effectively communicate with. And this is really why, in my opinion, emotional intelligence plays such a crucial role in personal success, in interpersonal relationships and professional envir environments, as it's ultimately... Um, it ultimately influences how individuals communicate and how you resolve conflict. And you have to be able to communicate and you have to be able to resolve conflict to lead any type of organization. I mean, it goes for any part of your life. I mean, as a mom, I need to be able to communicate and resolve conflict. Um, as a wife, as a friend. Um, so I don't need to agree with, you know, any of you as leaders, uh, of, of any of my leaders at my company, any 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 leaders, but I want to respect those leaders, and I want to know that those those um those leaders respect me as well. And then if that is possible, I feel like that is where emotional intelligence, you know, really plays in and awareness of. And this just takes so much sometimes in my experience. Awareness of your own emotional state is exhausting. The ability to recognize not only your explicit biases, but your implicit biases as well, and take note of these biases that you are actively saying, like, I don't even know I have these. But then the more you dig into it and try to make yourself aware of these, you realize that you have them. Um, and I'll, you know, kind of tie that into everything as well, but just really taking that, you know, self-awareness and being able to handle your personal emotions constructively navigate those social interactions, your professional interactions, as I said, and really any relationship with strong communication and empathy, I feel like is a skill that can really navigate through so many different challenges in life. Um, so I have a funny fish example. Uh, so I am not, I, I do a couple things. Okay. In my life. And there's a couple of things I do really bad. Um, I am a terrible plant mom and I am a terrible fish mom. So I say, when I walk into a pet store to get fish for my kids, like they're all like swimming to the other side, they're like, Oh gosh, not her. And I really try. That's the thing. I don't try to like do this to them. But recently we've, we've gone through a whole extravaganza of, of fish and I've noticed I've been trying to understand which fish are male and which fish are female because my worst fear is that I have like baby fish and there's just like thousands of them. So what really fascinated me as I was doing this really weird, you know, evaluation in my home was that the male fish were not pretty at all and all or the male fish were extremely pretty and all the female fish were just like not pretty at all. And, um, it just really fascinated me to evaluate the, you know, why do women historically need to abide by social norms of beauty, wherein like so many other elements of biology, the woman is not actually the beautiful one. Um, and I know that sounds so outlandish, but then it really like took me down this road of evaluating intricate dances around uh, societal norms of beauty and professional appearance. And I mean, these expectations stretch 
far back into history, like when men in women's roles were like so rigidly defined and, you know, a woman's value was met placed on her measure in her ability to conform to certain standards. You know, she had roles in the home, you know, that were very much in a private sphere where men were out in the public sphere, um, hunting and gathering. And this is essentially where societal norms formed and their roles were seen as more beneficial than women's. And this is essentially, um, you know, where they received that patriarch and that status that we see today. So this, you know, eventually societal roles came and placed value on them regardless of personal choice. And it, it's just like a deeper societal structure of power dynamics. But, you know, what's really interesting is like you fast forward today and although we've made these tremendous strides and echo these expectations, like an echo of these expectations is still present in how we're perceived and, you know, the subtle pressures that we as women face every day. Um, and now I feel like women need, they, they feel that, you know, to be taken seriously and to be respected for their intelligence and their abilities outside of the home, um, they have to exclude, exude this you know, what we would historically say are super masculine traits. And, you know, I, I look at Hillary Clinton for this, like her pantsuits became a symbol for her, um, you know, a, ray, a way of redefining what power looks like in spaces for, you know, that were traditionally for men um, and asserting identity and, you know, challenging norms without having to say anything. Cause gosh, you just don't know if anyone's going to be listening. Um and, you know, there's a quote by, by Gloria Steinem, and she's a spokeswoman for the American feminist movement. And she pointed out, you know, while we've made so much progress in how we raise our daughters, embracing qualities, again, of that masculine, what we normally see as traditionally masculine, we've yet to fully embrace the reverse for our sons. Um, and, you know, what, what does that mean for us? How do we navigate this landscape landscape? And, you know, we're often expected to balance this assertiveness with approachability and competitiveness with collaboration and confidence and humility. And, um, you know, my last kind of like touch on this, that's, that's a little bit personal is when I was in seventh grade in social studies, I'll never forget this girl, her name was Beth Campbell. And she came to this exam dressed, you know, to the T, like she um, had her hair done. She had white eyeliner on, she had a dress on, she had pantyhose on and heels. And I, I mean, I was probably wearing like fat farm shoes and like bell bottoms. I don't even know if you guys know what these are and probably also white eyeliner because like who wasn't wearing white eyeliner in, you know, 2005. Um, but I looked at her and I said, oh my gosh, you look great, but why are you dressed up? And I'll never forget her response. She said, yeah, when I'm nervous, I need to look good because when I look good, I feel good and I do good. And, and that's stuck with me. And I think about it all the time. And, um, but looking good is so subjective. And that's kind of the whole point of all of this. Cause what makes you feel good? What makes you do good as a woman? And there isn't a correct answer and there isn't, you know, one answer. And I think, that is something that, again, I, you know, really think about. And for me, you know, and again, kind of a funny example, I don't really like my nose. I broke it in kindergarten and genetics weren't on my side. And, um, and that's why I wear a nose ring, but I wear my nose ring and I wear my nose ring because in my mind, whether it's true or not, it hides my nose and it makes me feel confident. And when I'm confident, I can present myself with more confidence and I'm more confident. I communicate with others and, and we accomplish more, me and, and the people I'm communicating with. So is my nose ring the traditional type of professional attire? Absolutely not. Um, but every time I think about taking it out before a meeting, before I'm presenting to a large group, before I'm interviewing, before I'm looking for funding, um, I think about Beth Campbell. And I think to myself, and I and it might be the only thing I remember from that class but I'm like, you know what? It makes me feel better and it makes me more confident. So I'm going to do it. Um, and, and really why that matters is this personal lens shapes. And we kind of go back to the implicit and explicit that bias that I talked about. This personal lens um, shapes my implicit and explicit bias. When I hire, for example, do the best candidates always look like what you expected? Absolutely not. Uh, mm. And those expectations are because you had implicit biases, whether you recognize them or not before that person walked in the door. And that is something I think we as women have always had to challenge. Um, so redefining professional for women and what that means, I think is an, is an active 
example of emotional intelligence and to, you know, really wrap it up as we move forward. I think it's so important that we carry with us the understanding that our appearance and what is professional is a part of our toolkit or what feels professional and good for us is a part of our toolkit, but, you know, it doesn't define our value, um, our capacity to leave. However, we, we should use it to empower us as a tool to be our best selves and to shine. And then lastly, just to kind of bring it home, you know, I have led teams bringing on, I really like to mentor as, you know, that's kind of been a theme here, young women. I've been in some really, you know, I've had some really interesting discussions. I've seen really interesting behavior, like attention seeking, you know, wanting to kind of move through co corporate culture. What does that look like? I've, you know, it, it gets, it can get really strange. Um, so I think there's not like a one size fits all solution. Um, but some of the things that I set forth with my teams in advance, especially when I'm mentoring women is like, just understand the context, you know, understand your self-worth, understand your self-awareness, um, and choose professional attire that you feel is going to make you feel confident for that setting. And I'm going to trust you because you're not a child to make that decision for yourself. Um, obviously like grooming and hygiene, super important. So I'm like, okay, that's just like a standard, like outside of expressing yourself. And then, you know, again, just like bringing it back to like confidence is key because we can be invited, but that does not mean we're going to be asked to dance. I mean, look at 1920, the 19th amendment, women were given the right to vote, but then they had literacy tests and toll taxes to pay. Nobody could do that then. 1963, we had the Equal Pay Act, but then they, you know, employers use different job classifications. Um, and essentially like bypass or biased performance reviews. And then I think my last good example of, you know, coming to the table or coming, but not being able to dance is, you know, 1964, the Civil Rights Act, like, you know, discrimination and employment against race, color, color, religion, sex. I mean, um, that is where the term, oh, and this is a really good point. I like to bring up, I really hate to use uh, cultural fit because that came from the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And that was a bypass that employers could use that terminology by uh, employers could use cultural fit as a way to discriminate against people without breaking the law. So Kind of a fun fact there, I try to actively not say cultural fit. Um, and also, you know, not being accepted into, you know, mentorship programs that gave people resources and ability to network and access to equal education and opportunities. So that kind of wraps it up. I know I went kind of long, so sorry about that, but I'm really passionate about it. And I'm so impressed with all of you. And I know that being where you are, you've done all these, you know, things and you've navigated all these things. And I'm probably telling you nothing new, but at the end of the day, know that I'm here with you. Like I always love a good, like empowerment for women. And, um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. That's so I'm going to try to, let's see here, <clears throat> get, get us back to our screen. Oh, shine tight, folks. Sorry. <clears throat> All right. All right. We're going to wrap up. Next steps. I'm giving you a few to do's, last minute to do's, if you would. Um, remember to make a quarterly donation if you haven't already, please. Think about a nonprofit for next quarter. We're always looking for folks to make a nomination. So you can go on the Greg Fine platform and do that. We'd encourage you to follow us on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel. Um, and follow us on LinkedIn as well. Invite a friend if you are women. You know so many others that perhaps could benefit from being a part of our group. So please help us to grow our group. Invite a friend. And we look to see you at our next quarterly meeting on June 5th. Thank you all very much and have a good night. Bye, y'all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks, time. Thanks, Mandy. Bye. Bye, -bye. Great, Bye, -bye. Job, Mandy. Great job to our other presenters.